um, and I ended up with a, a, an ARIMA uh, model. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it, it was also desirable to capture other other effects like uh, football derbies and things like that that are, that are expected to, to affect some of these series. So my concerns, I didn't really want to get too involved in forecasting, if I'm honest. Um, I kind of said, well, the only thing you can say about forecast is it's always wrong. Uh, so I was somewhat nervous about being drawn into it. Um, healthcare data, I'm sure most data, but certainly healthcare data seems to have a lot of variability in the in the series. Um, I'm kind of nervous of implying uh, spurious precision. Um, I think we're always going to be very careful when we're telling people forecasts, you know, uh, how they are actually derived and, and what information they use and not let people think that um, they're, they're going to explain everything. Um, there'll, there'll be times where they need to use their common sense if something's happening that the forecast can't take into account. Um, I think often, but especially in health, uh, the, the transparency is important. Um, so that people can see um, why we're making a particular forecast rather than it being a rather than being a black box. Um, and this is just a note for me, obviously, <laughs> I'm sure you all know this, that it's, it's critical not to just get a model that fits well to the um, to the to your training data. It's got to actually fit well to your to your forecast data. Um, like I say I did this in 2019, so it's a while ago now, but we were fortunate that we did have quite a, an extensive data set. So for a series of different um, uh, different hospital sites. We had data going back uh, to 2010, so I had quite a, a training set to use there, and I generally use that for training and then and then forecast the whole of 2018 as the test data. Um, as I say, I didn't really new to R, new to forecasting. Um, you don't need to know too much about that slide. We'll skip forward. This was kind of my bible, to be honest. It was a um, a book by the people who wrote the R forecast package. Um, but it, 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 I found it gave what I thought was a good introduction to forecasting methods as well, as well as showing you how to implement them in R. Um, but I see now when I was putting these slides together, I see now there's a there's a third edition because they've uh, changed so that rather than using the forecast package, they use another package, package called Fable, which uh, which works better with the tidyverse. But it was uh, yeah, it's the second edition I was using. So as I mentioned, the existing methodologies that that were being used were um, fairly basic, but but a did perform quite well, but they, yeah, the, the, the point about the seasonality one, it, it, it didn't cope well if there were trends and step changes, which the which there often can be. Um, so I did look at some other other forecasting methods, exponential smoothing and TBATs and so on, um, pros and cons, but I think I reasonably quickly, because I, I had in my head that I really wanted to be able to include different um, covariates, um, it seemed that doing a dynamic harmonic regression model with ARIMA errors was was the way to go. So that's that's what I did. Some of this is just explaining for people who are not familiar with how forecasting and Fourier terms works. So I'll, I'll kind of skip fairly quickly, but uh, this was an example of a forecast someone else had done, which which is um, one of their dummy variables was the month. So I found this very unappealing that there's a big jump here. Um, just because you go from the last day of the month to the first day of the month and then it's the same and then jump up <laughs> first day where, you know, there's no reason obviously why a series would change just because um, just because you're on day one instead of day 31. So I found it much more appealing um, to have a, a, a model with Fourier terms where these things move move more smoothly. There are times when you do want to jump and we'll come on to that later. Uh, the variability it's um, yeah. Uh, th there's lots of things that people say, like oh, Mondays are always busiest in hospitals and bank holiday Mondays, there's always fewer attendances and those things, while um, true on average, are certainly not true on every occasion. Mondays are not always the busiest. Um, the seasonal patterns can change and so on. Um, it became apparent to me pretty quickly, as expected, that school holidays are, are very important for these uh, series and um, Easter moves. <laughs> it's not the same time uh, of year all the time. Um, and there can also be trends and step changes. We've got like daily data here. I've put it weekly here so you can see a bit more clearly. So there's some obvious trends that that stay. So school holidays here, there's there's quite a dip in this in this series. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of other variation. And um, yeah, the the jump here from from this year up to there. This is one of the challenges with with healthcare data. You you'd think. If you're talking about um, attendances and accidents in emergency department, you, you, that will be a fairly consistent thing, but it isn't necessarily. There's there's often ways that um, changes in the way these things are, are, are classified and recorded. Um, so generally a, a type one 
uh, A&E department is, is we tend to call it an, an emergency department is uh, certain requirements. It's 24 seven. It's run by a consultant and various other things. So um, th that's uh, that's one type. There are other types of departments. So urgent care centers, urgent treatment centers and so on uh, are generally called type three departments. However, over time, there's there are changes to how things are, are coded. So um, in the past few years, for instance, it's become reasonably commonplace that where there's a um, an urgent treatment center that's co-located with a with, a, with a, an ED, so it's on the same site. Uh, people have tended to start including all all the attendances, um, lumping them together as type one. So you can have a situation where you've got a, a attendance at a type one department showing a big step change. And it's usually because there's been a change in classification. So any forecasting method that that wants to work um, across a lot of um, different sites is potentially has to deal with those those kind of issues. So my first plane about was just just throwing the data into a basic auto arima, auto arima model uh, and actually it, it fit quite well um, on the as I say on the on the uh, training data. Um, so that seemed quite impressive 6.1% um, average percentage error. Um, but uh, how useful is that actually for forecasting? You, in fact, I didn't draw it here, but you, you end up just getting a pretty much a flat uh, medium term forecast, which isn't necessarily that helpful. Um, so I initially put in some various terms to capture the day of the week variability. Um, and I started off with two pairs of terms for the for the time of year. Uh, I got a little bit of a better fit and perhaps more importantly then the forecast you can see that it's it's capturing some of that seasonality and certainly the, the daily seasonality and it's it's replicating that going forward in the, in the forecast so that was kind of a start um this was kind of really showing the people um using r but um just doing just doing a loop to to decide how many Fourier terms i actually decided i wanted um i ended up with with seven fitting well um and interestingly i think we'll see when we look at profit later on profit does that automatically and also picks the same number. And I think actually uh, we've not got dates on here, but um, again, it became apparent pretty quickly that that these were um, school holidays. Um, so it's, it's clear it's capturing quite a lot of that. It's a big summer holiday and October half term. It's quite a while since my kids were in school, but it's February half term as well, isn't there? And, and as we say, we've got Easter. Um, so so that's kind of appealing. It's capturing quite a lot of stuff. But yeah, it's because you're doing it as Fourier terms, although you can see that's to do with school holidays, um, it's perhaps a little bit hard to explain to people. Um, also, in fact, as we'll see, the, the changes on school holidays are, are often quite sharp. And so perhaps you do want to model those um, separately. Um, and yeah, this this wouldn't be able to pick up the fact that holidays like like Easter move. So my next step was to put in dummies for um, well, for two things really, the um, the known bank holidays, um, some of which are the same dates every year, some of which um, like Good Friday and, and so on are not. Um, some also things like August bank holiday will be a um, you know a Monday in August, but it's not always the same date. So put dummies in for all of those, and then importantly the um, dummies for the school holidays. Now. Um, Obviously, not all schools go on holiday at the same time, so you you actually can end up with with a lot of um, a lot of different dummies here. Um, and this model also could be somewhat challenged if those um, if those coincided. Uh, it, it it didn't like that if you've got holidays clashing. Um, the other thing is to um, go and search around for what all these school holidays were, especially in the past uh, in different areas is can obviously be quite challenging. So I just spent a little bit of time trying to, if you like, reverse engineer how how school holidays were um, were determined. Um, so, for instance, here in the West Midlands, it became pretty clear that what they tended to do for October half term was it was the um, the week which contained the last Wednesday in October. So I, I had a few expressions like this that would find that Wednesday and then work out which week that was. And then it's not just the actual week of the holiday itself that's important, but also the weekend before and the weekend after. You know, if people are going away, then they'll, they'll often be going away for those weekends. So um, created a lot of school holiday dummies like that. Um, here's my um, uh, one of my big long um, outputs from uh, 
Cholmondeley forecastings, as as you all all know, but lots of people, um, when you show this to them who, who are not familiar with coding, uh, a surprise. You know, it's just one line of uh, one line of code to actually to actually create the uh, the forecast. It's all kind of wrangling beforehand, creating these dummies that that takes the time. Um, and yeah, I was just explaining here about this being a a log linear and and what the coefficients mean. Um, so these are the different components from that model. Um, so we've got obviously the uh, the, the daily vari variability here. With this is quite a striking. Um, Mondays are very busy. Saturdays and Sundays um, very quiet. Um, I think that probably suggests I can't remember which site this is, but this suggests this is probably um, includes some of that lower acuity activity. Some of the uh, attendances are probably the kind of discretionary oh I don't feel very well but I'm not going to hospital on a weekend but Monday I'll go um you probably get less of this at a department that's that's a very focused type one that's just taking the high acuity emergencies you people who have a heart attack you know don't decide well should I go to hospital or not that's uh, they just go um so here we've got the bank holiday effects um so um you know May bank holiday here for instance tend to get fewer attendances on the Monday than a normal Monday, but you tend to then get uh, more attendances on the Tuesday afterwards. Um, so that's the common common sort of pattern for a Monday bank holiday. Um, Christmas is usually one of the quietest quietest days for attendances. Um, New Year's Day, however, um, uh, can be busier. Um, certainly, the second of January as well. Um, afterwards, I think this is even more striking for um, ambulances. Uh, I believe. Um, First of January is, is often their busiest day. Lots of people out on New Year's Eve um, end up needing an ambulance. And then here's here's the bit that um, I spent the most time with. So this these are the uh, school holiday dummies uh, I created. So some was kind of as you'd ex as you'd expect. Well, saying that, this I think you'd find would vary somewhat between um, between sites. So some places like, for instance, Blackpool near us. Um, where people tend to go on holiday, you will you'll actually often get um, higher attendances uh, on holidays um, as opposed to a lot of places where people go away from on holiday. You, you tend to get fewer attendances and these things would also vary. Um, part of the work we're hoping to do with uh, with Even and Kandrika is look at, at uh, attendances by uh, different categories. So to do this is using the just the headline numbers we get of total attendances. It's just a it's just a, a blob number we get for each day um, on a on a sit rep report situation re report. Um, but we can also look at patient level data and 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 split this up in different ways so we can look at different categories. But for this series, um, yeah, school holidays usually fewer attendances. Uh, there's a few things going on here with weekends before and after holidays. Um, but it, it's it seems to be capturing those um, reasonably well. Um, not huge effects uh, compared to the daily effects, but but th there definitely seems to be a pattern there. So um, this is just showing people how you can how you can put that together in in something like R. Um, I was showing my forecast, the actuals in red, um, prediction intervals, and then highlighting um, where those dummies actually were: the school holidays and the the bank holiday weekends. So evaluating that, um, I created a, um, a a few different kind of batch scripts. So we've got here the there's actually two <laughs> two I was comparing with here. The the uh, pure six week um, forecast. So literally just the average of the six weeks. So you know the past six Mondays, past six Tuesdays, and so on. Um, and then the numbers I was told that the RCM RCM team RCMT team had forecast. Which is not always exactly the same, so I think that's the little tweaks they were doing for bank holidays and so on. And then this was one of the one of the versions of the um, model I trained um, and comparing it. So what I did here was um, uh, imagining that it was the end of 2017, and each week I created a forecast just using the information I would have had up to that point. So for the first one is the whole of 2017. Uh, up to the end of 2017 forecasting the first week and then the next forecast is using that extra weeks of actuals and forecasting forward from there forecasting 13 days forwards each time um, so running that 52 times for each site um, and calculating the the average errors and um, you know 
it beat the um, it beat the naive method by a bit, but not a huge amount. As I say, it's, it's surprising how effective those those basic methods are. Surprising to me, anyway, at least for that relatively short time horizon. Um, but it did beat it um, for every hospital uh, apart from this one. Um, and, and that one is one where we know there is a step change. Um, so, yeah, that example, there was a walk in centre, which in the early part of the data wasn't included and then afterwards was. and There was no way to separate it out. And so the model perhaps didn't didn't cope with that brilliantly well. So that's one way of evaluating it. Um, this is so this is another way of looking at the same results is just how many weeks would would this would the method I created have been better than the um, the RCMT method uh, and, and most weeks it, it's better but there's still going to be some weeks where actually the naive method would have would have um, had a lower average error than than my method uh, one hospital where it's just the same again the one where it's actually worse that's that's the one with the walk-in center um, and then a, another way of looking at it, um, I was curious about the longer horizons uh, and I was surprised by this because the earlier evaluation that had been you know, using information up until um, the point of the forecast and just going forward 13 days. Here instead, I just ran it once using all the data to the end of 2017 and forecast the whole of 2018. Um, so didn't use that extra information of what had happened during 2018, whereas the RCMT method did. And yet still, in most cases, it it, it beat the uh, beat the other method that's got more information. So I was quite pleased about that. Um, did try it on some other series as well. Um, the errors seem bigger for uh, for admissions. Uh, so that's admissions from um, the uh, emergency department to um, to the hospital bed base, so people going into a, into a bed in hospital. Um, but again, it generally beat the other method. Me medical admissions as opposed to surgical admissions there, that's a distinction in health, is, is people who need surgery versus people who need, need other help. And um, ambulances, I'm not quite sure why the old RCMT method was so bad for ambulances, but the new method was, was considerably better for those. Um, and I got as far as showing how you could uh, how you'd implement this in the in a data warehouse and you could present the results. We we do quite a lot of stuff in Tableau. You could do it that way, or if they needed it still in Excel, how you could put it back into Excel and and do it like that. Um, this was just showing people um, that you shouldn't be surprised when sometimes things are outside the uh, the confidence limits. Um, you know, in this case, um, ninety one percent of the points were within. Uh, the 95% uh, confidence limits, which is kind of roughly what you'd what you'd expect. So, I kind of got a reasonable way with that. Um, but as I say, the 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 team hadn't got to the stage of getting their data into the data warehouse so we could actually implement this, and then COVID hit, which obviously changed everything. Um, so I just thought I might show a few slides as well on on COVID. So uh, we didn't try to forecast COVID. Um, in fact, I have to say, and I think a lot of people now recognise that perhaps one of the problems at the beginning of COVID was that people relied on models a bit too much. Um, and, you know, there were epidemiological models um, expecting COVID to be very much like flu, which which in fact it really wasn't. And also, um, I get the distinct impression there was quite a lag between people making, uh, doing these models, doing their projections and this filtering up to decision makers there. And when things are moving so quickly and doubling in three or four days, um, that can be very dangerous. So in the first wave of COVID, I was shouting pretty hard that actually things were happening a lot quicker than people thought. And um, when Sir Patrick Valence, for instance, was saying, we're two weeks behind Italy. Uh, you know, we might have been when somebody ran the numbers to say that, but by the time he was saying it, we really weren't. Um, and uh, similarly, I think there was a point where Boris Johnson was warning that if we didn't do anything, cases will be doubling in. I can't remember what the number was now, maybe three or four days. Uh, and it's like, well, no, they are already doubling that quickly. So, um, yeah, people didn't perhaps listen to me at <laughs> that time, but uh, afterwards, yeah, they in following waves, they they did want to hear. Um, what me and my team thought about this, um, because yeah, we've been we've been right initially. Um, so this this isn't forecasting, but this is just getting people's head around what exponential growth means and how quick it actually happens. Um, and also, I think the lessons 
were that you can't just look at the national figures. Um, you, you really need to look at where it's happening first because because it's going to happen then elsewhere. So um, in kind of um, here we're coming up to September 20. I think there'd already been outbreaks in Leicestershire um, at this point, but then it was it was the northwest of England that uh, that, that next had the uh, had the increases. And when we saw these numbers going up here, I don't think people recognised in the local system how quick this was going to happen. And I think a lot of them were thinking in terms of, OK, numbers are going up by nine patients a day. That's, you know, that's not too bad. Um, whereas we're pointing out, well, the alternative way of looking at it is they're going up by eight percent a day. And if you if you project that forward, do you realise that? And I think we said uh, I think it was I think it was a fortnight after the data we're using, these dark blue lines, you know, within a fortnight, you'll have as many patients as you did at the peak of the first wave. Um, and that got people to wake up and, um, yeah, I believe those numbers were used in quite a few important conversations. Um, and as it turns out, I think we were maybe a day or two out. Uh, it was, it was, it, I think it was perhaps 16 days instead of 14 days, but, you know, the, the lighter blue bars are what actually happened afterwards. So clearly a lot closer to the exponential uh, growth and the than the linear growth, which I think you know now everybody accepts, but but back then some people uh, weren't getting the head around it. Um, and yeah, a, again the point that you've got to look where it's going to happen first. This was the next wave where again northwest of England uh, high cases, uh, and it was clear it was going to spread everywhere, and and sure enough it did. But if you were just looking at this point at, at national figures, you didn't realise how quickly it was increasing. And then the um, the next big wave was the Omicron wave, um, and I think there was a different lesson there to understand what was happening. I mean, fortunately, Omicron obviously um, is uh, was less um, or less lethal, less less. Uh, sorry, I said it wasn't clinical. Can't think of the term off the top of my head. Um, but had less serious impacts, uh, at least for for many people who caught it, than than the earlier variants. Still, obviously, terrible for many, but. Um, um, not as extreme, but the, the way the cases grew. Um, what we're trying to show here was if you could just see um, th this time it happened first in London. So we use London numbers to say what we thought would be happening uh, in, in the northwest um, afterwards. Um, if you could see how many Omicron numbers you had at this point, we would have said um, the increase in a, a, like 19 percent a day. So that's a doubling in, in every four days and you, you project it forward like this. Um, the trouble was, uh, if you already had a thousand patients in hospital down here, and you didn't know which were the the delta ones, which was which was stable or falling, and which were the new omicron ones, it, it looks like if you look at those numbers, th th these total numbers are only increasing by four percent a day. So you'd actually, if you're just looking at the the total numbers, you you probably project like that but they'd have very different outcomes. And obviously I didn't just make those numbers up. The, the wiggly line is 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 the actual numbers of, of patients in hospital in London. And so this had been pretty steady at around about just over a thousand for quite a while. So a reasonable assumption that that's your kind of underlying um, Delta variants. Um, but the point was that your Omicron numbers were growing very quickly. Um, and sure enough, it, it was following our orange line, not our not our blue for quite a while. I, I should have filled this in a bit further. It, I think it actually ended up about here. It did slow down a little. But again, I think that was important. And again, like I say, it's not forecasting. Um, it, it's, you know, this is just this will, is what will happen if this growth rate continues, which sometimes is a simple story, I think, is is as important as um, as a detailed model. So that was COVID. So after COVID, I did come back to look at forecasting. There's still the requirement from from the RCMT team uh, to do these daily forecasts. And indeed, they've been asked to uh, could they do some longer term six week forecasts, which their methodology wouldn't wouldn't work with well. And also they've now finally got their data into the data warehouse. So it's a, it's going to be a lot easier to, to systemize it. So revisited it. Um, I had heard pre COVID when I'd shown some of my forecasting work to some um, uh, people at uh, NHS England, they they mentioned profit then, and I'd heard since I had a look at it then. It looked interesting, um, and I also heard that you know it has been it, it's used quite widely now in health. Uh, there's various ambulance services and trusts that use it, so that kind of hurdle of acceptance has been passed. So it it certainly seemed worth looking at to see how useful it was. Um, so you think you 
probably aware of profit, um, but if not, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what you think about it because it, it does. Um, I stole this slide from a from a an operational research uh, course I did, which which also talked about profit. But as it points out, it does rather go against uh, forecasting literature, which worries about serial correlation and so on. Um, and as I understand that, it's a it's a a gown. Um, it's an additive model, and it attempts to uh, capture um, the various different effects um, and, and hopes to end up with uh, independent identically distributed errors so you don't have to worry about those serial correlations and so on. Um, as I say, interested to know if people think that's reliable or not. Um, one of the nice things about it is it's quite happy because it is that structure of a model. It doesn't worry too much about missing data. I threw some data in here as, as a missing point. You can just put a, a, an NA in there and profit doesn't mind about that at all. Um, similar to the early model, you can, um, you've got various different components. You've got the daily component here, as we said, busy on a Monday, quiet on a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, the Fourier terms, um, it's picking up the same kind of dips that I did when I did the, uh, the ARIMA model with the Fourier terms. Um, bank holidays here, I've put in, I say it was relatively easy. For, I ended up start, well not ended up, I started doing uh, my experiments with profit in Python because that was the, the example notebook I had from the course I'd done. So Python rather than R. And um, yeah, profit lets you add in um, holidays for um, a particular country. But the version I've got at least, uh, I think the holiday package has been updated so that you can't specify directly with just one term England. You have to you have to say UK and a subregion England and profit doesn't let you do that. So at first I thought that was a pain, but I realised it's quite an advantage actually, because instead I can just use the holidays package to bring in all the UK holidays and then take out the ones I don't want and put in the ones that I do. Uh, so that means things like I can get rid of St Andrew's Day, which really didn't have much of an effect for these English trusts, but I can leave in things like St Patrick's Day, which is today <laughs> and which does seem to have an effect. Uh, there's, there's often a lot of people go out and celebrate on St Patrick's Day, especially when it's a Friday, so that will affect attendances. So you put those in and the bit I guess about um, profit that's quite different to uh, other models is that the trend it uses, it can actually do it a couple of different ways I think, but this is doing it as a linear piecewise trend. Um, so it's trying to pick up um, pick up the trend just by breaking it into pieces and deciding what's, what's kind of a reasonable smoothness. Um, which I guess has got advantages and disadvantages. This here you can see it is picking up COVID, but um, um, how can I say, in a kind of very gradual way. It, that's not quite how it happened. So one of the things I really want to do is that various people have done, looked at different ways of, of accounting for that COVID period um, in, in profit. I suppose that's another another point about me leaving this forecasting for so long. For, for quite a long time, obviously, we were in COVID world and nothing was the same. So previous forecasting models, I'm sure, would have really struggled. So it's only since we've had, you know, a year of, I guess, the new normal that it be, seems to become sensible to start trying to forecast again. So um, I will wrap up quite soon. I quickly, you know, find you can do these nice plots and you can show the whole series. That there's the, there's the actual COVID dip and the the, the way that Profits trying to deal with it, uh, and you can zoom in and look. So I tried to um, compare the profit, a very simple profit model with um, the original RCMT uh, forecasts. Um, it was a little bit better, but um, not a lot better. And you know, 20% um, average error here, quite disappointing by uh, for both methods. I think the reason for that is probably just probably pretty unfortunate with the time period chosen. Um, this is weekly data now just to show you the same series. Um, so we had data up until the end of December and then we're trying to forecast for for January. And this December was just very unusual. If you look at like that whole series there, this peak here was crazy because um, a number of different factors, normal winter pressures. It was we'd not had flu for two years. We had a very sharp um, uh, flu season. Uh, there was cold weather as well, which which you get various slips and falls, attendances, things like that. And the main one was on top of all that, um, don't know if you remember back, scarlet fever. Uh, lots of concerns around scarlet fever in children. So uh, lots of people taking the kids to um, to A &E, uh, worried about potential for uh, for for scarlet fever. Um, so very very high attendances in December. 
and then we had very low attendances in January. Um, the orange line is is the pre-COVID line. That's the equivalent 2019 period. So very busy December, but a quiet January. And I think a number of reasons for that, not least of which were strikes. So ambulance and nurses strikes. I think similar to COVID, when people were very worried about COVID, they stayed away from hospital unless they were had a really very serious urgent need. And that took a long time to come back up again. Um, I think in January, oh, uh, ambulance nurses strikes, people thought we better not go to hospital today. Um, so one of the reasons why attendances were low there. So I'm hoping if I do cross validation, look at performance for different periods, then the profit model might might perform uh, better than it looks like from what I've done so far. I realised quite late on as well that I'd only used data from I think 2017 onwards, but I can go back to the old data that I had and join it together and, and go from 2019 to see if that helps, particularly with um, kind of bank holiday patterns and things, which wouldn't affect the overall average error that much, but are probably actually operationally very important for people um, to, to have a decent idea of what's going to happen, for instance, on, on the unusual days, the bank holidays and the Tuesdays afterwards and so on. Um, again, I want to get the school holiday dummies back in because at the moment this is, yeah, it's picking up the October half term and the February half term and so on. But um, uh, but yeah, it's not doing that thing about movable Easter and you'd like these to be a bit clearer. So I want to put my uh, holiday dummies back in. And as I say, ideally generalise so I don't have to go searching around for what the different holidays were in different parts of the country. The business about the residuals, you know, are the are the assumptions that profit makes reasonable or not? Are they being satisfied? Uh, as I said, I want to deal with the COVID period, uh, compare with more robustly with other approaches rather than just that comparing with the RCMT one. Probably should redo it in R because the CSU, uh, there's more people with skills in R than there are with Python. So it probably makes more sense from a resilience point of view. And then, yeah, what was the ultimate aim? Uh, productionize it so that we can run this um, in the background overnight and create forecasts for multiple sites, uh, which probably is one of the advantages of profit and one of the motivations for Facebook creating profit is because it does run a lot, lot quicker than than most uh, conventional approaches. So it, it is feasible to to do that um, and then, yeah, implement it across many sites. And then finally, um, yeah, the work we're hoping to do with uh, Ivan and Kandrika, uh, one of which I think is particularly important is is incorporating the effects of weather because um, we said here we've got things going on at school holidays, but the other things going on are, are almost certainly to do with um, to do with the climate. You know, it, it, we don't get more attendance here because it's cold July. It's it's to do with the weather. Um, and to understand that they're not going to be they're not going to be simple linear relationships. So what we're hoping to do is is, as I say, break things down into categories and then look at different weather conditions that will affect different types of attendances. So that could be as simple as kids playing out when it's nice weather, uh, falling and tripping and so on. Um, when it's very cold, when it's below freezing and it's been raining, you'll get a lot of slips and falls. When it's probably cold and humid, uh, it's uh, for a longer period of time, is probably what exacerbates um, things like COPD and other respiratory conditions. And then especially critical as, as we get more and more um, global warming, uh, looking at attendances due to, due to heat exposure kind of effects and more prosaic ones like um, sunburn on Blackpool if it's a sunny um, bank holiday. <laughs> so that's the work we're hoping to do. Thank you very much. I will try very hard to stop sharing and not leave the meeting like I usually do. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, now I've also asked uh, a colleague and a friend of mine, Bachman Rustam Tabar. He's a reader at the University of Cardiff. So I've asked him to provide some uh, comments. So Bachman, over to you. We had some difficulties with the sound. Uh, before and looks like Teams is misbehaving again. Um, maybe while uh, Bachman is uh, fixing the sound, uh, I can uh, make a comment and maybe Andrew, you can uh, say something about that. Mm -hmm. um, because I see that there's a lot of comments in the chat. I can see there's a few, a few questioning, yeah. questioning Facebook, definitely uh, questioning profit. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, if you have questions, please type them in the chat. I will uh, ask them. And uh, the general idea of the comments is that uh, profit is not doing well in practice. So, uh, and actually, Bachman and I have written a paper where we tried profit, but it was hourly data. 
and it wasn't doing um, not wasn't outperforming other approaches so from your experience andrew uh, can you comment on that yeah i i, I don't imagine uh I don't think profit was was um, designed to outperform other approaches, to be honest. Uh, my reading of the motivation for it was that um, there's a need for at scale forecasting um, and, and a limited supply of experienced forecasters and, and time to, uh, to apply those methods um, most appropriately across different data series. So I think I think the motivation for profit was to come up with a forecasting method that was i guess good enough um and it was very quick and didn't need um so much tuning um and so it could be used it could be used at scale um mm -hmm. so i yeah i wouldn't expect it to necessarily beat other methods i best i guess the question is is it good enough for the practical purposes that its advantages um outweigh the disadvantages um which yeah mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested to hear people's thoughts Okay, thank you. Can but, you hear but, me now? Ivan? Yeah, we can hear. Ah, yeah. Right, lovely. So over to um, you. Then. Okay, well, th th thank you so much, Andrew, for the presentation. And it is thank all you. great to see your journey. I think it has been fantastic. Yeah. And uh, again, great to see that you're using R. And I know that uh, we have NHSR community in UK that push for this, which is great as well. Indeed. Maybe we need a, we need a Python uh, Python community as well uh, in NHS that push for Python as well. I think that yeah. would be great. I, I have a few um, observations in general when it comes to healthcare data. I think um, the first question that we could ask when it comes to healthcare data is what are the attributes or features of healthcare data? And as we know in healthcare data, in many cases, uh, we have the most granular data that is collected. So I'm talking about patient arrivals, for instance. And again, in across uh, healthcare, we see this everywhere that we collect this sort of, um, I, was, I would say, patient level data, that, which is the most granular data that we can get. So this actually brings some opportunities and some challenges when it comes to forecasting. Um, so th this kind of, th I mean, the first question we could ask when it comes to this data is, well, which level of temporal granularity I should forecast in? Because you get arrival data, you can forecast at hourly level, even half an hourly, 15 minutes, daily, weekly, you can go to monthly. And I know that, again, this is a discussion about the temporal aggregation and temporal um, hierarchies as we go from, let's say, half an hourly to, to yearly, how you have to forecast that. I suppose this could be dictated by the decision that you need to make, but generally there might be a level where you can get the most accurate forecast, but again, it's a challenge, so you have to determine that kind of thing. The second thing that comes out is it could be a challenge or it could be also opportunity is uh, this sort of data, normally they have um, multiple seasonal cycles, so you will see within a uh, day, you will see um, within week, or you see yearly seasonality, this kind of thing. And you may also have long seasonality, but also non-periodic seasonal cycles as well. So again, this sort of thing bring challenges, how you do that. Uh, and of course, when it comes to doing it, you have mentioned already profit, but in general, there are, I see the three approaches to deal with this kind of thing. Either uh, you could use harmonics, as you describe some of uh, approaches that you have used harmonics, uh, or you could use basically predictors. I think at some point you mentioned weather, for instance, that could be a predictor, or you could, you could use lagged observations. These are three ways to model uh, this kind of long or multiple seasonality. Uh, and of course, dummy variables could, could, could go to, uh, to this as well. Um, and when it comes to models, so again, we could actually see different families of models like regression family or status space based family, or we could also decompose actually this uh, series and then forecast them differently. For the, again, the, team, uh, the, the profit that you mentioned could go to the regression family, for instance, but also TBATs or um, double seasonal hot winter kind of model could go to state space, for instance. So these are the ways we could also do the, uh, the forecasting there. Another important thing is when it comes to healthcare data, uh, in my opinion, the majority of work in practice or in, in research 
focus only on um, forecasting the aggregate demand. Uh, like here you mentioned the a &E attendance. It, we can provide a lot of examples of that aggregate demand forecasting. Uh, but when it comes to forecasting more granular information that actually would be much more helpful when it comes to making decision, there isn't much work there. So um, basically we are not talking about how many people you will see in the front door, but also the type of people coming in, the type of illness, how long uh, they're likely to stay. Basically, these are very helpful information that could help a manager to make better decisions when it comes to discharge or bed capacity and this sort of thing. But I think this is an area that needs a bit of more work, I would say there. Um, I know uh, maybe we need also to go back uh, to people asking, answering questions, but uh, one, uh, I mean, the, to be honest, I have a lot of things to discuss, but I will uh, I will leave it in one last comment. So in one of the slides you mentioned about concerns, and I think it's, it's very important that uh, to recognize that these are important concerns to deal with. For instance, you mentioned about um, how forecast is used. Surprisingly, this is a very simple question, but when it when you go to people, you are very surprised that they don't know how to use the forecast. Mm. They are just going to forecast something, but when how when you, uh, to to use it, they are not very sure actually about it. But this is something that you need to figure out before actually going to the forecasting part. And another important thing that we often forget is we chase the forecast accuracy, but we forget that there is a limit to forecast accuracy, right? So we can't, at some point we can't we can't do better than that and simply because you have randomness with your observations, with your data, and you can't do more than that. So I would, uh, instead of chasing the forecast accuracy, actually I would invest my time and, and trying to link the forecast to the business value and see how the forecast actually results in a better business value or better decisions rather than chasing it to be, to be more accurate. Um, I think... I leave it there in terms of the, like the comments, but I have some questions as well. I don't know whether I can ask questions or you can go to audience. Well, let's uh, see first, Andrew, whether do you want to reply to this part and then Bachman, you can ask questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, so lots of fascinating points. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, share a lot of the concerns about how are the forecasts actually used. I think the argument is people use them for rotors and so on, whether they actually do or not. I'm not 100% sure, um, but yeah, it, it was yeah. My requirement was to do it. There's other stuff we've looked at where we have tried to do things to maybe answer some of those other questions. I wouldn't necessarily call them forecasting per se, but certainly understanding patterns and what regular patterns are, uh, and that that issue of seasonality. I think um, we've looked at and is important. Um, I'll, I'll I'll grab the screen again for a few seconds if that's all right. Um, and just move you over here. Um, yeah, this so so these are these are um, hourly attendances at a, at a particular site. Um, so we've we've done quite a bit on that. This was really illustrating a point when in COVID people were um, concerned about how much busier they were, and we were trying to point out that actually it probably wasn't to do with footfall. It wasn't that a lot more people were arriving. So they're, they're the people arriving each hour. But sometimes it's important in healthcare data to look at things in slightly different ways to to the way they normally do. So it's very easy to look at attendance data. Um, however, uh, if I can make this go backwards, yeah. Uh, this was where Ron just looking at attendances. This is looking at how many people are in the department in a point of, in time. Mm -hmm. So this is why they feel so much busier. All these weeks in 2021, they had far more people in the department than even the busiest week in 2019. Um, and, and that's essentially a simple consequence of the fact that the people that were arriving were all waiting a lot longer. And that in turn is probably down to discharge issues and finding beds for people and so on, which we did show some of that um, as well. So yeah, I looked at some of that in terms of of patterns haven't yet attempted to actually put it into a, into a forecast and um, just a point on the when you talk about the granularity and looking at things um, in more detail this this was a similar thing again where uh, so this is looking at people in bed so again it's quite easy to look at how many admissions there have been but that doesn't take into account the different lengths of stay and in particular older people tend to stay in hospital a lot longer than um, younger people um, so if you if you um, 
yeah, calculate how many beds are in use at a point in time. It's 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 all the older age groups, even though uh, the number of attendances actually for these groups, the number of admissions for these groups are very similar. Um, and there are some quite predictable patterns um, for 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 some uh, respiratory conditions, for instance. And we, we talk a lot about flu, um, but in fact, actually, in, in, in most beds aren't taken up by people with um, with the primary diagnosis of flu. Uh, it's 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 actually people with pneumonia. Um, they can go together, but you know it's actually pneumonia that's probably probably the issue, a along with some other seasonal things like bronchiolitis in in infants, which happens a bit sooner, which has an impact on 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 the pediatric services. But because children generally are only in hospital one or two nights, it doesn't have a huge impact on on the bed base. So yeah, I just I just just show some of the things that we've done um, looking at some of those elements. But yeah, all all very good points and, and questions. Thank you. OK, well, maybe one question, Bachman, because we have several from the audience. Yeah, all right. Uh, so I think one, one important thing that you mentioned in one of the slides is, and it's fascinating because this sort of question comes up more and more often in, in NHS, is um, how much data should I use in my model? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you mentioned that you use uh, from 2009 forward, and of course you may have more data. And this sort of question comes up quite a lot. I had actually this question about uh, three weeks ago from NHS, uh, from uh, sorry, Welsh Ambulance. Um, so, what do you think about that? Do you think um, if you because you know as we go further, we will collect more and more data. So we need to make this decision whether we keep all of this data and use it in our model oh no at some point i decide i just need to use the last five year data and i discard the rest of it do you think this is a good practice um i, I probably probably again be, be led by either either what people have been forecasting longer thing or or what i could see from experiment i suppose uh, there'll, there'll be some things. If if something's um, very regular and predictable, you would hope that you wouldn't need very much data to to capture that. Um, I think perhaps for things like um, bank holidays, it can potentially be very helpful to have a longer series of data, particularly those bank holidays that don't happen on the same days. So if, for instance, you want to say, well, actually, what happens when it's Christmas Day on a Friday, and then you get the weekend, and then you've got bank holidays then happen on the Monday, and then thing after that, you know, I think, I guess it, it potentially would be useful to be able to see what's happened when that's happened in the past, though, obviously, the further you go back, there's so many other things that have changed in the meantime, those patterns may not be valid anymore. So, um, yeah, I tend to say horses for courses, I suppose. Very good, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Bachman, for the comments. Uh, and thanks, Andrew, for uh, responding. We had a question from uh, Natalie. Uh, I will make you as an attendee so that you can unmute yourself. Oh, wait a second. Did I? I think I ruined something just now. <laughs> <laughs> she appeared and then, and then disappeared. Yeah, that was my uh, doing. Wait a second. I don't see her in the list for whatever reason. Uh, OK, so we will try to fix that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, OK. I'll try to fix this, Natalie. <laughs> Sorry for that. I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Valerie asks about MAPE. Are there any other error measures that uh, you use or other better ones? Um, yeah, I think I did have a slide somewhere, didn't I, which listed some of the other things. Certainly when I was um, deciding on Fourier terms and so on, uh, I was using AICC um, for that. Um, yeah, to be honest, as I say, I've only kind of got back into profit uh, in, in the past, um, well, months, I suppose, but not had many, much time to spend on it. So my first pass was looking at MAPE. Um, but yeah, certainly I recognize there are other metrics as well that can be that can be important. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Right, N Natalie, let's try that again. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm like, yeah. maybe it's not such a bad idea to drop me, but um, <laughs> hello. Um, hi, everybody. Can you can you hear me? Um, yeah, hi, okay. hi Natalie. Hello. Um, thanks for the presentation. I have I have a couple of questions. It's actually kind of related to what Bachman was saying. So I work for a cancer hospital in the United States, okay. and so one of the things is um, our hospital, in terms of forecasts, 
um, pediatrics department does completely their own thing. So they they manage completely different their admissions and um, inpatient outpatient procedures. Yeah. So one of the things is we are now working on forecasting the pediatrics unplanned admissions, which is basically those emergency emergency ones. Mm -hmm. So somehow my time series never look as pretty as kind of the ones you're showing. They, they're never <laughs> like that. Um, but so number one is the volume is obviously much, much lower. Um, and so we're looking into it. In terms of unplanned admissions, we're looking at something between like two and twelve. Um, I don't see seasonality. I don't see patterns outside of day of the week. And day of the week is literally just weekday versus weekend. Um, honestly, in our case, we dropped completely 2020. Um, it, it affected so significantly that it just doesn't even make sense for us to try to adjust for it. So we're actually only using 21 and 22 data. So, um, so I guess, um, and and so we are forecasting only five days into the future because these are actions, and I don't think I have much time to explain what actions are being taken, but we know those. So, um, are there any kind of suggestions? Um, is it just literally we're talking about some sort of like a random walk or averages in this case, since I'm not able to detect patterns? Um, in we tried something like um, Rima, we tried year over year. We tried uh, moving averages. I haven't tried profit actually, but um, so any any comments or suggestions? I mean, I mean, just off the top of my head, I would say um, anything like this. Uh, to me, I'm sure there's more to it, but really, to me, forecasting is is just understanding really those seasonal patterns, whatever they are, and applying them. And if you're talking about unplanned admissions for cancer, um, I I can't. I'm trying to think what would that be influenced by, um, you know, and I'm perhaps not too surprised there isn't too much predictability to that. I can't imagine that it does really vary by, you know, some like I mentioned bronchiolitis. I don't know if you have the same mm -hmm. issues yeah. um, in, in the US, but something like that is clearly a very clear seasonal pattern. It happens just about the same time every year. Um, you know, cancer, I w I'm not aware of many sort of seasonal factors and, and also, you know, it's not a kind of discretionary thing. You know, you don't think, oh, I don't feel very well. I'll leave it a few days and that kind of thing. You know, it's so mm -hmm. personally, I'm not too surprised you you don't okay. find a lot of predictability there. OK, that okay. makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Natalia. Right. Uh, we have a couple more from the audience. Uh, one of those is, um, do you have any suggestions around uh, forecasting referrals for distributed network of clinics uh, and also have you considered any graph-based forecasting approaches um i haven't used any graph-based forecasting methods um this may well prompt me to uh, investigate them a little um forecasting referrals for a distributed network of clinics um I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure what that would be. It, it does make me wonder if um, it, it was a, a point we, we made just before the, the call proper started. Somebody made a comment about uh, healthcare data often not just being a question of demand of supply. Um, and I wonder if that perhaps um, applies here as well. And certainly we're thinking about in terms of um, if you're forecasting the tendencies, then I think they are fairly um, well. <laughs> they, they can be influenced by a lot of things as well. As we've seen by COVID, you know, some of it's discretionary. There's also a bit of if you build it, they will come. You create a new urgent care centre, you're going to get attendances that previously would have gone elsewhere. There's that kind of thing. Um, and so there's a certain amount of discretion, but it, 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 that, it is still essentially a demand thing. I think when you get onto forecasting admissions, for instance, and I would suspect probably referrals and that as well. Um, Certainly in the UK at the moment, um, I'm not sure it's said out loud that often, but but hospitals are, are generally so full, it's so difficult to get a bed that I think the admission thresholds will inevitably um, change somewhat. So you, you might have someone who, if the hospital was quiet and had plenty of free beds, will be admitted. Um, but actually, if they don't have the beds for that person and they're having to admit people who are more serious, then, um, yeah, you, you'll find that actually your admissions are um, more to do with the supply of how many beds you've got, then, then you can put people in beds as opposed to the actual true underlying demand. Um, may, maybe, maybe that partly answers the referral thing as well. Uh, actually, Bachman replied something to this. Um, Bachman, do you want to make a unmute yourself and make a comment on that? Uh, 
Uh, I think, um, again, I'm not 100% sure as Andrew mentioned, but I, I suppose this refers to where you know you have the nodes that you want to forecast and then there is a relationship somehow between these different nodes that, and that relationships could be hierarchical could be grouped structure or could be any other kind like as, as a graph network and this is where you can actually use the hierarchical group kinds of techniques that could be used there okay very good well we're in out of time uh maybe only uh, one final short question uh, to, to, by Carlos to what extent the output of the forecasting is useful on daily basis yeah well I, th I think we've touched on that haven't we um, I, personally I'm sort of a little skeptical um, but we are asked for it um, you know the, the the trust want it um, I, I mean it is an important point and I accept I've probably gone around it backwards and 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 as, as Backman points out uh, and normally I would say whenever you're addressing a problem you know know your audience understand the business case and how it's going to be used um, so yeah hopefully especially if I do develop some forecasts I can get some better understanding of how people are actually using them um, in practice um, I think my experience a little of being involved in um, what well, they're now called system control centers where where there's a there's um, essentially coordination for a healthcare system going on. Um, people actually use the forecast just to, just to talk in terms of um, how things have compared to what the forecast was. So if they say, for instance, the ambulance services say, well, we've had, you know, 10% more calls than forecast. Um, I think they're actually using it to a certain extent of a, as, a, as an indication of what unexpected pressure they're under. Um, so that, that's, that's, I think, one use. That's those curves I was showing before about the hourly arrivals and the people in the department, we also use those in the system control centres to show um, which hospitals are under particular pressure if they've got a lot more people in the department given that time of day, you know, if they've got 20% more than they would normally have at 5pm, um, then we say, you know, they're, they're under a certain amount of pressure. Um, you can't just say an absolute number because as you can see it varies a lot. 50 people in mid-afternoon is probably quite normal. 50 people at 7 a.m. You, you've got a big problem coming because you're going to you're going to get a lot more people coming in. So so I guess comparing the forecast to the current actuals tells you how much pressure you're under compared to how much you might expect. And also it can be useful comparing that across a number of uh, hospital trusts, for example, in a system. If you can say, well, actually, this hospital's under a lot of pressure, this one's under less pressure, could we consider, for instance, an ambulance divert and send ambulances to a different hospital and so on? So th there, there's some of the ways I've seen them used. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I fear a little bit, if I'm honest, sometimes it's there's a dangerous forecasting for forecasting's sake. But, um, mm, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for a great presentation. Thank you, Bachman, for the comments. And thanks a lot to the audience for your questions. And this is it for our uh, Friday Forecasting Talks Season 3 and see you all in Season 4. Have a nice break. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Oh, and I am, I am happy if you want to share those slides, uh, Ivan. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll share them over the LinkedIn then. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.